Hi, and uh, welcome to this webinar held by the Danish investing and stock portal Invested DK. Um, I would like to introduce our speaker today, Jeppe Kirk Bunde, one of the most copied investors on the uh, global trading platform eToro. Um, my name is Nikolai Clinton Peterson, and I will be your host tonight. Uh, first, I would, uh, of course, like to welcome our audience, both from uh, Denmark and from uh, UK and abroad. We have a uh, very broad audience today, and it's nice to uh, see you all. Uh, to quickly introduce Invested DK, we are a uh, newly founded club for for investors, which overall purpose is to make investing easier for uh, for everybody, basically. Um, and with this in mind, um, I would like to introduce our speaker today, Jeppe Kirk Bunde, one of the most copied investors on the uh, global trading platform eToro. Jeppe is uh, managing a 4 million US dollar device diversified uh, portfolio, and he has a 31% uh, average annual, annual return from 2013 to 2018. Um, Jeppe has a background as a uh, managing consultant and have advised some of the largest banks and tech companies in the world. It's therefore, of course, a huge honor to welcome Jeppe Kirk uh, Bunde and hear about his uh, methodology methodology and uh, strategies when it comes to investing. I'm pretty sure we can all get some some new ideas for our portfolio from such a well-performing investor. So with this in mind, uh, yeah, but let me just um, hand over the screen to you. So you should be able to take the screen. Yes. Okay, then uh, it is uh, your word, if so to speak. All right, welcome everybody. So yes, my name is Jeppe Kirk Bond. I'm a popular investor on eToro. Um, if you want to use this for anything, you just have to carefully read the presentation and the disclaimer. The agenda for this uh, meeting today is first, I'll give a little bit about my background, then about eToro, then what it's all about, investment strategy. Then I'll go in on uh, some of the opportunity areas that I see based on this investment strategy, how I've uh, made my portfolio and how I think about co uh, portfolio composition in general and then compare that with how uh, wealth is in the world. So how have I chosen to um, allocate my wealth versus how is, is global wealth in general allocated? Then I look at um, how have returns for different asset classes been in the past and how do I think they'll perform in the future? Then if we'll go down from this broad level into seeing how can we then pick different companies in an industry, then I um, look at some of the multiples that I use to benchmark different companies. And then if you want to go into even further detail to look at how good is a, a single company, then uh, one of the methods that I use is a discounted cash flow analysis. So I'll show how I, I do that. And then finally, to sort of evaluate um, what is what are the mega trends and what are the big things that are driving the global economy. I have a, um, some uh, some points on that. And then uh, I have sort of to, to um, look at uh, not just what are the things that are driving it, but sort of how can we look at that in a mathematical way. We have all the uh, the indicators. And then finally, I've compiled a little uh, tool set with some of the uh, tools, websites, and useful links and books and stuff that uh, I've found very, very useful and that I think others would find useful as well. And then if you didn't get to ask your question um, during the presentation or I didn't cover it, then we'll have more time for questions at the end. So firstly, um, I've been investing in eToro since 2013, as Nikolai said, with a 31% average return. And uh, while I've been doing that, I've also been working as a management consultant, um, latest with the Hacker Group uh, here in London. And my background uh, um, is uh, in finance strategy, but also with some knowledge of politics. And I think that's that's worked well as a mix for sort of understanding the whole picture around the company. If we look at eToro, back when I started investing in eToro, I did an initial uh, analysis in Excel where I looked at um, what are some of the different uh, trading platforms I would uh, consider using? Back then, I looked at Interactive Brokers and Saxo Trader and eToro, and I, I looked at them. You know, how how are their prices specifically for what I need to? Not what are their prices for all sorts of other things? Um, do I like the mobile app? Do I like the platform? Do they have all the products that I want? And then I scored them, and eToro came out as number one. And then I started with eToro, and then I've been very happy with uh, using that ever since. And it yeah, it keeps getting better every every quarter, every year. And one of the things that added is, of course, the copy trading, where you can copy other investors such as me for no extra cost. 
And then when I make a trade, you make exactly the same trade. Um, and then if I do well, you do well. Um, there's a broad uh, availability of stocks and uh, ETFs, Forex, cryptos, um, commodities. I'm mainly in stocks. And for pricing, you pay a quite small spread. There's a conversion fee. There's a withdrawal fee. The only thing is, for me, I would say the, the pricing for leverage and for shorting is a bit high, but I don't use much leverage and I don't use much shorting. And you always got to look sort of, if you if you are a person who trades a lot of um, stocks every day um, and you're trying to, to capitalize on, on a small movements every day, you'll be paying a lot in fees. If you're a long-term investor who generally buys something and holds it for a long time, um, you are, th that becomes less of a priority. Um, then um, if we look at my investment strategy, it's I have sort of six fundamentals that always stay in place. Um, and the first one is fundamentals. So I like to look at companies and use valuation techniques, find out what I think the company is really worth, and then compare that to the stock price. So that means that I'm sort of looking for something that I can buy at a good price. Secondly, I look at macroeconomics. So just getting an overall view of what is the interest rate landscape, what are the different countries doing GDP-wise, which industries are growing a lot, what are the big changes and risks that I need to uh, look out for. I try generally to invest in, in megatrends. So if I see something that is... Uh, um, is growing a lot and it seems to to be able to grow for a long time. That's something that I really um, want to be part of and ideally have a company who's riding that wave. Then um, a principle I have is, is for long-termism. There's a great quote by uh, Benjamin Graham, the uh, sort of mentor of Warren Buffett, who says that um, in the short term, the market is a voting machine, in the long term, a weighing machine. And that's very much my philosophy as well, that in the short term, there will be a lot of um, second guessing of what others are thinking and looking at, you know, if, if this company will be successful or not, the stock price can move up and down quite a lot based on what people think it'll do. But in the long run, if a company becomes very big and very profitable, it's also gonna have a very high share price. And I'm very happy to just sit around and wait for that while it goes up and down, if I feel confident that this is a company that can become really, really great in the long run. Then for risk management, I try to diversify across geographies and industries, but in a, I have in total about uh, 40 different investments. I would ideally actually like to go down to 10, because when you go from one investment down to 10, you're getting a lot of diversification. When you go from 10 to 40, you get more diversification, but you don't necessarily need to have a thousand different investments to be well diversified. It's fine if, as long as you sort of ensure you have something in the different continents and in different industries. Then there's, um, with respect to hedging, I generally avoid that. Um, there's a lot of things you can do to protect your portfolio that cost you an insurance premium. And if you try to protect yourself against every little thing, you end up paying a lot of insurance premiums. So I think you're better off by just being well diversified and accepting a bit of risks here and there, and then they'll average out to an okay result. And finally, as I mentioned before, with the pricing, I try to keep the fees low. So that's why I don't uh, use shorting. I don't use leverage. And I try generally, I mean, I would like to just buy stocks and hold them and not have to do any trades. But, you know, sometimes the stock goes up a lot and I have to sell it or I find something new that I prefer and I have to sell something to be able to invest in the new thing. Um, but I really, really keep an eye on that. Then where has this led me to find good investments in um, it, it will have to be in areas where there's something that others um, don't appreciate as much as I do. And so one of the things that I've appreciated a lot and that I've made investments based on is organic growth. So that means companies that are either making new products or selling more of the products they have, but are not just um, acquiring their way to growth. And quite often when you pick up an annual report, you'll see in the, in the, you know, with the first chapter, there'll be the chairman's uh, note and it'll say something like, great, again this year, our revenue grew by 2%. And that's very fine, but if it's um, just because they acquired someone else to get that extra two or four percent, then then it's um, then it's not a, a a very strong indication that this con company will continue to um, to create more value. So I really look at organic growth. If a company is buying something like when Facebook bought Instagram, they buy the company at a very low price while it doesn't have any revenue. And if they then grow it and are able to really improve the business afterwards, that's great. That's organic growth. But I'm really, uh, really, really conscious of that. And I really like organic growth. Then um, overreactions is something that I've invested a lot on and hope to continue to invest a lot on. That's generally if there is... Um, sorry, there's... Yeah, good question. Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, 
but um, speaking of organic growth, you might also touch upon this uh, later. But uh, but where do you uh, where do you find that information? So when you look at um, a company's annual report, they'll usually only report their total revenue and their total profit. But you simply have to look at all of the acquisitions they have made. So you can go online and you know if you just follow the news of the different companies that you invest in or want to invest in, you can always find lots of information about the acquisitions they have made. And these companies that they've acquired, you know, before they got acquired, there were still companies, so there's still information out there. And if you can't get the exact number that you need, say the revenue or the profitability, you, you're not going to get it completely wrong. They're not going to be, you know, suddenly uh, worth billions if they were acquired for only millions or uh, so and if 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 you if so if you really really have something where you can't find anything you can always see something well how many employees do they have what what sort of product do they do, are they making so you can sort of get an idea of what what acquisitions have they made and then you simply take the 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 revenue for uh, for the total company and say all right I'm going to deduct what I think these acquisitions had in revenue to to get down to my organic uh, revenue so that that's uh, that's is a little bit of an exercise you can't do it automatically but but that's how I do it yeah. So basically, you you dig deep into uh, the yearly report of the companies. Definitely the yearly report, but also a lot on Google on uh, on the internet, reading very di many different places. It can be from lots of places where I find that 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 piece of information that I feel comfortable with. But often it'll be something where if it's if it's something like a small acquisition for one million dollars. I, I I might just call that one million dollars because it's not gonna 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 change. If it's a billion dollar acquisition, it's more important to be precise than if it's a small one. That's that's a, then you just sort of you are aware that it's there. You put in a little number for it, but but that that's fine. It's important in general to be right on the big numbers and on, on the big things. If you're sort of right on the on the big six things, it's all right. If you're a little bit inaccurate in all the small things, you want to sort of like. If, if your ballpark riding can see that it's a good investment based on the big things, that that's good enough, I would say. If it's if it's such an investment that you have to get every single little uh, micro detail about every acquisition right, then it's 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 too tight for me to invest in anyway. So it's got to be you know with such a margin of safety that I don't have to worry about whether that little acquisition did have a bit more revenue than I had anticipated. So okay, that's regarding right. organic growth. We move over to the overreactions. Um, I've made a lot of good investments, and um, I think I'll continue to make good investments when there is a story in the media that doesn't size up with the 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 actual business impact of the story. So you have a piece of news, and you can sort of value. Could if it's a lawsuit where it says on all the front pages they've been they you know they've been fined fifty million dollars. That can sound like a lot, fifty million dollars, but if the whole company is worth a hundred billion dollars, it really doesn't matter at all. And you can sometimes see the stock, you know, drop four percent on the news or something like that. So that that can sometimes, if you were already considering buying this stock, this can be just what pushes it into the ground where you're like, okay, now I'm investing. Now it has this uh, this media story that's that's out of proportion. I mean, it's negative, but if the price impact is a lot um, a lot uh, more than than what the news story should really um, uh, fairly uh, do, then then it, it can be a good good moment. Then I always, when I when there are events and news stories, I try to size up um, whether they have the um, size to make a trust shock. So in general, an economy can take quite a lot of hits and still sort of carry on because you know if GDP goes from three percent to two percent or to one percent, this isn't. If a country gets a little bit more debt, uh, these these things can be negative or positive, but they'll sort of they, they'll they'll carry on. What what if there is a a sort of shock that can lead to runs or bottlenecks or when there's a backlog of something, that that's a different story and that can lead, lead to um, to suddenly needs to make big changes in the portfolio. And so I always look for if I think something is like in general with the world economy, if something is in the billions and you hear it on the news, you can ignore it. It has to be in trillions to be big enough to to do something. But so, so that's always. But so you can sort of if you if you just look at the numbers and you size them up, you can usually I I, I can usually see sort of like what is what is the size of this? Is this really a big thing or is it not? And it's not always that the that the media will will um, you know they'll try to make more of a story, even though it's actually not not that big a number we're talking about. Then I think there's a lot of companies that have high growth and either very low profits or no profits or negative profits, um, but that have high fixed costs that can be good investments. So here, if you have high fixed costs and you have low profits, but you have a lot of growth, 
that essentially means that when you grow a lot, your costs aren't going to grow at the same rate. If you have um, some of the most extreme examples, like um, Facebook and Netflix, they have a lot of costs to build these great platforms. But adding one more user is not going to cost a lot extra for them. So if they can double the amount of users and double the amount of um, ad revenue or subscriber revenue, that's not going to make their cost double. So if they have a high growth rate, but most of the costs are fixed, that can lead them to look very, very different. And here you can sometimes see a lot of other people that will say that, well, why would you, why, why should Tesla cost more than, uh, than Ford when they're not making as many cars? And that's simply because of the growth rate. So you're, you're, you're paying for that growth rate, and especially if it's combined with high fixed costs. Then um, sometimes you can, you don't have to predict the future. You just sort of have to, to understand what's here right now. Um, talking about products and product improvements. When uh, Steve Ballmer from Microsoft many years ago, he held the first iPhone in his hand. He was laughing at it and saying, look, this doesn't even have a keyboard. No business usually would buy it. Look at the price. I'm very comfortable with our position. And um, of course, he was proven very, very wrong by the success of the iPhone. But that was a classic example of holding the product in your hand and not being able to see that this is a blockbuster product. So when you show, it is a, if you're a good shopper who's capable of taking products and seeing out of this, this product, which one is, is, is the best product, then, then when that arrives and you can see it, then, then that, that's a much more safe environment to invest into because you're not investing in a startup who may come up with a great product that may sell. No, you're holding the product right here. You can see it. You can see that it's great and you can feel much more confident in investing in that. And then finally, you can have a company that's been run in a, in a not so great way for some time. And then there's a new strategy that can lead the company to perform much, much better. And when that happens, that could be a great time to invest. But when there's a new strategy, I try to make sure that there's, I want to see that there's at least one real action behind it because it's sometimes you can have some new um, talk, but there's not really going to come any action from it. So if the CEO goes out and says that now they have a new strategy and that, that doesn't necessarily mean that things are going to, uh, change to get much better. But if the company has also done something like they've made a divestment, so they've sold off a big part of their business, that, that signals more, okay, they're serious about this. Now they are getting rid of these things and they're going to focus on something different. And if you can see those real actions, then then uh, then that, that gives you more certainty that, okay, the strategy is changing now and now the now I, I can believe in this, uh, yeah, in this company. So then... Um, Finding great companies like that, you have to sort of put them together into a, a portfolio and uh, diversify across the S classes, geographies, and industries to reduce risk. There are also other areas like value chain stages and size, and growth, and profitability. But if we look at, at my portfolio, it's mainly in stocks. I have a tiny bit in ETFs and commodities and a tiny bit in cryptos. But I mean, combined, these don't really matter. It's, it's the stocks that, that, that matter for my portfolio that could change if interest rates come up to a certain level where I think, okay, maybe some corporate bonds could, could be added or it could be a situation where I would add more commodities. I've done that in the past, but right now I'm all in stocks. And when I look, uh, compare the different rates of the different asset classes later, um, that should hopefully show why that is. If we look at the geographies in the world, the biggest stock markets are Europe and the US. They make up a, a large chunk. And for me as well, these are the largest areas I have. One thing you'll note compared to China is about 15% of the world economy now. I only have 3% of my uh, money put with China. So that's a lot less. Um, essentially, before the whole debacle started with the trade war, I um, I, I decided to, to uh, before that, I was thinking about investing a lot more in China. I had looked at many companies I wanted to invest in, but then sort of anticipating that trade war, I decided to, to just halt it and I sold a bit of China stocks then. And maybe in the future, I'll add more more to China. But uh, for now, I don't have much. And for industries, I have a lot of different industries. So tech, pharma, games, consumer goods, financial services. So there's not one single industry that makes up um, the majority. But there's um, tech as the biggest one. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy with that right now. Then if, um, if, if these are, the I think, the keys for diversification to just have the geographical and industry one. If, if you, you, you can sort of also look at the value chain stages. So if you sort of imagine, some, sometimes you talk about that the smile of an industry can be changing. So if, if it's, a, if it's a, a frown, that's sort of like a, the, the, there's a manufacturing 
part, maybe there's a, a distribution and finance, there's a retail part. And it could be you have an industry where the manufacturers are making a lot of money and the distributors are making nothing and the retailers are making a lot. But then someone comes along in the middle like Amazon and they really push the distribution uh, margins down and suddenly it's the manufacturers and the retailers that are making money. Or it, it could be some others, but if there's a change to that value chain, then of course you don't want to have all of your stocks in one end, especially not in one end, that's the one that's that's going down. And similarly, you can have some big and some small companies, some high growth and some that are more stable, some that are profitable and some that are not yet profitable. And that's essentially how I look at uh, diversification. If we look at that compared to how uh, the wealth in the world is, you can see in the first year that um, while my eToro portfolio is a stock portfolio, um, we have definitely a lot of the world's um, value is in our buildings. So a lot in uh, private real estate, a lot in business buildings, and of course also in, in, in bonds and currencies and a little bit in commodities. But so I have a flat as well that I rent out. That's an investment property. And many people do have a property and property can be a quite good investment. And so if you have a property and then also have a lot of stocks, that can be a, a good way of diversifying as well. And, um, and both can be quite great investments. If we look at the at the world, we see there that it is North America and Europe that uh, that where most of the wealth is placed, and then of course China is taking up a bigger chunk now. And with industries, it's not one industry that's dominating the whole world. It's a lot of different industries that are each making up a little chunk and come together. And which is also why a portfolio can have you know some good investments in many of these different industries. If we look at, um, I have a yeah. quick question. Um, because I, uh, it's from uh, it's Jonas who is uh, phrasing it is it time to sell our stocks now? Um, but I would rather uh, uh, with the comment that you have uh, that you're mainly in stocks right now. Yeah. Are you are you with the whole, the given situation and the and the big drop we've had over the last year? Are you not concerned in that sense? Uh, I mean, I don't like to go uh, with the. Uh emotions like that am I concerned? I look at it and uh, if we take the next one here, which explains why I'm in stocks, it is essentially, if you look at, um, at, at the last 800 years, there's a great book called This Time is Different by Reinhardt and Rogoff, where they've looked at how the different asset classes has performed over a long history. So we've had stocks for over 200 years and before stocks, there were equity-like investments as well. And over all that time, they've yielded about 7%. That's also what they've yielded in the last 100 years. So stocks can double a half in any given year. Um, but on average, they go up with the 7%. And that means that there's never been a seven year period where the stocks were overall down. And if you invest and then the stocks get halved in value and then doubled and halved and doubled and doubled, and then you might end up with the average of 7%, then you can be happy with that, even though it was a bumpy ride. And if you had invested right before the financial crisis in 2008, you would have immediately lost half of the money. But then if you look now, if you had done that back then, you would have gained a total of 60%. So even if you had invested at the worst possible time, you would still have gained in total. Now, what is the then the the situation right now compared to um, where it was 10 years ago or 100 years ago? If you look at how profits are compared to the stock prices, the historical average is 15, but now they're a bit higher. They are about 21. So you'll say, okay, so you say 20, then you'll say, does that mean that the stocks are overvalued by 25% compared to the historical average? Yes, it does. But does that then mean that the stocks will just drop 25% to come back to the historical average? No, it doesn't. There is, um, if, if we accept that the historical average of 15 is a sensible number and we'll get back to, to that number again, then, um, then the most likely way or the base case for it going there is that if you say the stocks continue, the profits continue to grow by 7%, but the stocks maybe in prices only continue to grow at 5%, then they will be catching up by 2% every year. So then 2% every year until we've sort of brought it back to that uh, average relationship between prices and profits of 15. Could also be stocks will um, continue to grow in profit at an average of 7%, but the prices only grow at, uh, at, at 4%, then they'll be catching up by 3% per year. Or it, it could drop by 25% and then, then, then start growing both of them at 7% again. So that's... Um, that, that's essentially how, how I look at it. And so the stocks will essentially have to be at a lot higher price compared to the profit than that for me to look at stocks as a worse investment than, for instance, bonds 
and definitely a, a lot, lot different than that than for me to, to start holding only commodities or currencies. Because historically, commodities have given on average 0%. If you buy a commodity, it's not like buying a business. You're essentially buying a product and you're keeping that product. And a long time after, you still have that product, but it hasn't really increased in value. That's been the historical case. And for currencies, where I, I try to not have currencies and I try to get them invested in stocks as quick as possible in general because of the seniorage. So if you have an economy that is growing by, say, 2% per year, so there's 2% more people, 2% more products, 2% more transactions, and 2% more money, then the inflation will be zero. But essentially, that 2% increase in money is a tax on you for holding the money. So you already, if there's 0% inflation, you're already losing that 2%. Now and there's inflation on top of that, you're losing that on top of that. And that's why it's historically been quite bad to hold currencies. And for the future, I think it's going to be pretty bad as well. So that's why I have, um, have, have everything in stock still. Now there could be something, if I deem that there is something that I see as the trust shock, that, that might lead me to, to do some big changes quickly. There could be something where the price has changed dramatically and it, it causes, um, my mathematics here to be different to say, well, I no longer think stocks average uh, performance should be 5%. I think it should be uh, 4.5% and bonds should be 3.5%. And I go and say, you know what, actually, I don't want to pay to, to I'm not willing to take that risk. I'm going to reduce my risk a bit and, and move over into to some bonds for that. Um, some do it in a, in a way where they sort of say, okay, if, um, if, if bonds are yielding higher rates and, and, and the, the average expected uh, performance for stocks is a bit lower, then maybe they change 5% into bonds, then 10%, then 15%. Um, so that's a possibility as well that you do it a bit bit slowly like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at that as well, but, but um, for now, definitely holding on to, uh, to stocks. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Then um, from looking at uh, the broad asset classes here and the industries and so forth, if we then look dive into one uh, industry and we want to compare some different stocks in that industry to see which one of the stocks um, do we want to invest in, then we can look at some of the multiples for the different companies to see how they're performing and to see what price we are paying compared to that performance. So here it's, for instance, with the FANG, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. So this is uh, with updated numbers. I originally made this when I had uh, when the FANG stocks had grown quite a lot in the beginning of last year, and I was contemplating, okay, I want to reduce my exposure a little bit, but then should I sell a little bit of each of these stocks, or should I maybe uh, um, maybe uh, sell more of, of of some of them? And I ended up getting rid of Netflix back then, even though it had performed well for me for some time, but because of of, of this, uh, how the numbers looked and how they still look. And as we then compare the companies here, we first see the profit, EBIT, uh, earnings before interest and taxes, compared to the revenue. We can see that Facebook um, is very good. It's like twice as high as Apple and Google and five times higher than Netflix and 10 times better than Amazon. So that's very, very good. Facebook are really, really making a lot, a lot of money from their, their advertising. So that's, that's really amazing. And similarly, when we look at the growth rate, it's absolutely insane what all five are doing and within that, especially what, what Facebook are doing. So they're really, really achieving tremendous organic growth. Um, if we look at, so the two uh, top charts here, uh, the, the higher, the better. But for the ones in the below, the lower, the better. So the one in the bottom left corner here, we're looking at the enterprise value. So that's the total value of the company divided by, so the, uh, the market cap and the debt together, divided by the profit of the company. So here we see that, for Facebook, we are only paying $18 in price to get $1 in profit for Facebook. And also quite low for Apple and reasonable for Google. But if we look at for Amazon and Netflix, we are seeing that we are paying a lot, a lot of money to buy these companies compared to how much profits they have. So that would then lead, say that that's only worthwhile if we're expecting their profits to be a lot higher in the future. Because clearly you don't want to be paying $80 to just make $1 of profit every year. That's um, that's not a very good good in investment deal. And if we look at the enterprise value compared to the revenue, here we're seeing we're paying eight times um, the revenue for um, for Facebook. Now that's all right because we also know that they are getting a lot more profit out of that revenue. If we look at then Apple and Amazon, they are quite low here, so we're not paying too much for the revenue. But for Netflix again here, we're paying a lot for the revenue. And we are paying a lot compared to the profit. And the growth rate is good, but it's not like Facebook's. And the profit margin is decent. And so overall, that, that makes me, me see that, okay, maybe uh, maybe 
there needs to be something extra which which comes this is sort of the hard numbers and then you compare them with with how uh, how how good you actually see the future of these companies if you're willing to pay that much more for netflix like that you that can only be worthwhile if you truly believe in the the future of netflix and then to to understand uh, that in more detail you have to look at the individual company and the way you do that is then with the discounted cash flow analysis now you can sort of with the multiples um get the whole way to an investment essentially you with it with the greatest investments you can make them on a piece of paper or almost in your head because if you can see a company has a great growth rate and it's a very low price compared to their profits and you can see that the products are great and many other factors you um you, you that that can that can tell you more than enough that this is, will be a great investment um but you can also try to um to, to put up a full spreadsheet and get in all the details that you want in there and play around with it, see what, what if the company grows its profit at this rate, if the cost of capital is, is this, if the their cost structure is like that, and then, then, then see what, what, what is the company really worth then. And, and that can, um, that, that can then, then inform you that if, if you think it's a good investment or not. So for this is an example I've made with Tesla. So it's taking into account we have from uh, essentially what I expect they'll perform. So that's a base case from next year, the year after, and so forth, all the way until 20 years from now. And we're doing that. So we have the revenues there. So you can use sort of evaluation, their financial statements, but you can also sort of break it into the way that you want to think about the company. So instead of looking at all the different cost types, for instance, I like to just look at what, how is this business really structured in terms of what part of the costs are variable, which are fixed and which are stretchable? Because that, that tells me what I truly need. How will their costs grow as their revenue grows? And of course, if you start to make profits, you'll pay taxes. If you don't have any profits, you don't pay taxes. And then you can look at what their debt is, how much more capital they will need to invest in the business to keep it going. Then you have some assumptions that determine what the growth rate can be. This turns into a profitability. Now, the further away from now profits come in, the less value that they have due to the cost of capital. So you'd rather have some money delivered in dividends next year than you'll have them in 20 years. And taking all that into account, you come to a, a evaluation of the company, in this case saying that Tesla should be worth 150 billion, yet with the market's value plus the debt is only 70. So that indicates to me that Tesla is at half price, that I think Tesla is worth twice as much as what it's trading for. So that tells me that it's a good investment. Now for this particular analysis, I've also done a sensitivity analysis that I haven't shown here, but this is sort of, this is one base case and that should be more than sufficient. But what you can do is sort of, you can play around with some of these assumptions and say, all right, if I ex expect that, you know, they're, they're gonna have negative profits this year and a few years more before they, they start doing well, what, how much are they worth then? If I expect that their cost of capital should be a bit higher, how, how much does that impact it? And then you can, can I mean, if you play around with those metrics, you can make the company seem worth anywhere between nothing and a very, very high number. So at the end of the day, if you make 10 different scenarios, you'll still average them out to one number that'll inform you on whether or not you should invest. Because at the end of the day, if you have the company being worth something and you think it's worth a lot more, it's that number that you'll be comparing and then deciding to invest. Um, so that's essentially how I do discounted cash flow analysis. If we then turn to... Uh, the macroeconomic growth drivers, so the sort of mega trends that are that are driving economic growth and creating these big movements that the companies can can either be part of creating or, or ride on. Sometimes you are investing in a company that's really creating the big wave. Other times you can invest in a company that's uh, supplying that company. So it's not the company that's doing all the flashy things, but it's the company that they are using. So they are you know one of their suppliers or something. We've, I like split it up in the, the political and social and the technology and processes. So one of the biggest factors driving value in the world is, is simple trust. If trust evaporates, it can, uh, on the other hand, also be one of the quickest ways to, for uh, the economy to deteriorate and uh, for markets to go down. Um, one of the areas where we have trust is for all the social constructs. So money, stocks, bonds, all of these are just contracts they are just social constructs that say that under certain circumstances someone does something and if if there's not trust in these again that um, can have very very adverse effects but trust in these can uh, enable a lot a lot of value creation 
we have a lot of uh, movements and taste changes that can be growing from almost nothing and then they're growing at 10 percent per year and people don't really notice them because 10 percent more f on top of almost nothing it doesn't really um it doesn't really seem like much but if it's sustained over time you can sort of spot that okay this is something that's really um, really moving and it's going to drive a business value as well if you look at institutional effectiveness there can be countries where um, there's a favorable tax regime, lack of corruption, good infrastructure, not too much bureaucracy. They say now, uh, Jamie Dimon keeps touting that in the US it took eight years to get a rocket to the moon, but it takes 12 years to get a government approval to build a bridge. So that's, if, if it is sort of that environment that you have to face as a business, that that's going to be very, very um, unprofitable. If you have... Um, liberalization so there can be some markets that don't exist and then they're liberated and they, they come into existence or at least they come into uh, an investor's mindset because before it might have existed but it not might might not have been easily accessible for investors and vice versa if there's something that's being made illegal that can of course uh, destroy that that business opportunity historically if we look at that 800 years of financial history peace and war has been a very very big deal hopefully that's sort of over with and we can can cannot worry too much about that, but I've left it in because if you look at the longer history, that was definitely one of the, the big things to consider. If we look within technology and processes, we have the big discoveries and big technological innovations from the research lab and all the way until they're actually taken to market. All along that path, there can be great investment opportunities. If we look at, uh, if you have a company that's, that, that's leading in its industry, but its best practices uh, sort of being picked up by the competitors because from if you look at very big companies after some time one of the the leaders of one of them will move over to a job in the other one so it's very uh, very easy so for some side of best practices to be spread from one competitor to the others and if your if if your your leadership in the industry is based on having some best practices that the others can copy it's probably going to evaporate soon so that's and, and vice versa then if you look at the competitor if you think they are behind but the things they're behind on are things that they can sort of easily pick up on and, and where they can copy the, the the leader then then that can also tell you that they will be uh, have an opportunity to do well and then you have of course continuous improvement that there are some businesses that are that are just every day doing things a little bit better rather than building up backlog backlog and bottlenecks they they keep finding better ways of doing things and if, if that's the case then then you know there might not be, be a big news announcement over it but you can definitely see the impacts in the long run with demographic changes you have of course um, well, one of the big demographic changes is that people are living longer, so there are more people that are older that have more money. And here you can find investment opportunities. There's also people that make big mistakes. If I see, for instance, I saw recently an advertisement with an um, with an older uh, actor uh, looking out over um, from a marina, and uh, I forgot what the advertisement was for, but I thought. That's good because it's appealing to people that have money. And you know, there's a lot of marketing agencies who are appealing to teenagers and are very focused on youth, even though there's actually a very, very big um, market segment with more money that this is failing to really, um, really uh, target. So, so you definitely want to um, want to be investing in some of, some of these areas. Then sometimes you have big mega projects that can really drive growth. But it's not always that sometimes the mega project itself is a bad investment, but it can lead to other companies doing well. So if you, for instance, have the big uh, Inmarsat sets up a whole range of satellites that uh, may or may not be great for Inmarsat, but there can be a satellite terminal company that's then doing extremely well because of this, because their satellite terminal is the one that works well with all these satellites. So then the mega project itself isn't a great investment, but there's companies that are benefiting from this. Then if you look at some of the... Um, various things that mother nature's throw at us there'll be something like this is a picture of the ebola virus there every year there'll be a new natural disaster somewhere in general these strike in one sub region or they affect a couple of countries here and there but if you are geographically diversified this sort of falls away now of course there could be something much bigger in the future but generally historically if you have a diversified portfolio these things they tend to sort of um, yeah disappear in the in that, that they only happen a few places, but not at the same time as they happen in the other places. Then that's sort of the um, the big drivers of growth. If we then look at how we measure that, there is a great, great website that's called tradingeconomics.com. If you go in there, you can look at 
many, many different uh, economic metrics from different uh, databases, and you can look at them by different countries and so forth. And if you just play around in there for a long time, just some, just just browse trading economics, you get a good feel for what the world economy is like. If you go in there and you just take a ton of different numbers and you see who's performing the worst in this and you see Venezuela and Argentina keep popping up, then that sort of tells you, all right, things are probably not that great in Argentina and Venezuela right now. And and it, by just checking that regularly, you, you get a good sense of, of, of how big are the different economies, how fast are they growing, what are some of the issues now, how were they performing before, what is new for them, what is, what is, sort of, uh, what, what is uh, something they've seen a lot of times before. And some of the main ones that I look at are, of course, how the stock markets in general are performing, inflation rates for the different countries. Some of these I can see in eToro as well, but I, I, I see them as well when I'm browsing around on, on uh, trading economics. And you can see some of these in relation to each other as well. Um, property prices, property prices have come up quite a bit. And in many places, they they the markets have stagnated. So then that might tell you, all right, um, I have property investments now are uh, sort of similar to stock investments and they, they've, they've um, compared to people's salaries they've reached similar multiples so you're sort of in the in the in the same deal that that it's still one of the best places to have your money but it's not necessarily as great as it would have been five years ago um, but not as bad as having your money in for instance bonds or commodities or <coughs> currencies I have a, a question yeah. here. Um, how often do you look at these? Uh, these are, seem long term, but is it something you look at daily, weekly, monthly? It's not on a, a fixed schedule. It's more triggered by when I read something. For instance, in, now we have the Davos uh, World Economic Forum. Then I, I, I watch someone say something, and then I go like, let me just check up on that. And then that sort of takes me on, okay, let me just compare that with the other countries. And then I might go and look at sort of GDP numbers in one day. Then the other day, it might be something like, like let me just actually have a look at, um, at the different benchmarks. So, so if I've done 31%, what, what, am I, what should I really benchmark myself against here? Or if, if, if there's a lot of, of, of talk about um, um, will, there, will there be a, a, a rate change or something, then I, I try to go in and, and, and look at those numbers in that sense. So I'm looking at something every day, but it's not all of them every day. It's sort of a, a, a I try to not fall behind on any of them, but it's sort of a little bit ad hoc on which ones I look at. Okay. If we then try to add to that, because a lot of those numbers that you will see in there tend to be um, averaged out for countries. There's a lot of work done trying to look more at cities as well and so forth. But obviously behind those numbers for the average, there can be some very different um, um, realities. So if you are out in the real world and you do see that India might have a certain growth rate, but if you then look within India, that growth rate is made up of somewhere where it's going and growing really, really fast and well and other areas where it seems there isn't much growth at all. So so the average of 5% might include both a zero and a 10. And so that's worth considering when you're, when you're, for instance, considering what sort of products will these economies be buying and what sort of industries will that then be driving? And then do you want to invest in, are they going to be buying toothpaste? Or are they going to be buying more expensive cosmetics as sort of a, a share of their wallet going forward? Um, so, so yeah, that, that's that's important to sort of um, also with some of them. If you look at, for instance, China, you um, you can you can get the real numbers there, but you also gotta 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 read a lot about what's 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 going on in, in different regions and so forth to to get a picture of uh, of of, uh, of of not just having one big average, but but having having some idea that that there can be big opportunities in a big country, even though they are insignificant, they, they don't really show up in the big average. Now, some of the, the, the sources that I've shown in this, uh, this presentation and, and many other things, I've uh, compiled into this uh, list of, uh, of tools and links and so forth. So these are some of the things that I, that, um, I use a lot and, and have helped me a lot, I think might be useful for people. So for some of the tools there, of course, eToro, this is the investment platform I use, also has lots of good um, data and ways to look at things. Y charts and Finvis are really good tools for sort of you can use them to look at all of the stocks and then see um, as a screener. I've found this to be not very useful. Um, 
essentially they try to sell you that you should use wide charts because of the screener. But if you if and you can, for instance, go in and look at some of the multiples and say, great, I want companies with high growth and low share prices. And then you find some companies and you look, wow, these companies look excellent. But then when you read more about them, you find out, ah, it's because there's a giant lawsuit and they're going to go bankrupt. And that's why they look so cheap in price. So if you look, try to, to do that sort of screening, you just end up with a long list of companies. And then once you study through them, you find that they're not really uh, good for investing in. But it can be a quick way instead of using Excel or something to, to get a look at a broad set of stocks. Reuters and Yahoo Finance do the same for free. And um, and international stocks, they're not as nice to use and so forth, but they are quite fine. The sec.gov has all of the data as well for US stocks, but it's also quite not nice to use. There's a, a New York University professor called Eswat Demodaran, and he has a, a website where he has lots of very good Excel models for evaluation and lots of good data sets um, for different industries. So that is very, very useful. If you look, I use mainly Excel for everything. Um, if you look in the industry, a lot of sort of specialist analysis. And if you look in the in big banks, you'll often see some people sitting working in Python. That's a popular tool as well. And finally, for lots of sort of standard uh, processes that are run in banks, they'll use S-Space. So these are sort of the tools that are really popular. Um, so if you are gonna gonna um, learn to use some tools, you can consider these ones. I use Audible a lot to listen to audiobooks. If you look at um, interviews with the, all the CEOs of the world, one of the things that that many of them have in common is they read a lot of books. And one of the ways you can also read a lot of books is to listen to audiobooks on double speed whenever you're not, you know, you have your ears free essentially. And um, I use Todoist, which is a sort of a productivity tool where I tell Todoist everything, what analysis I want to make um, and break them down and, and how important they are and in which category. And then, then I get my to-do list. And so I sort of tell Todoist what I want to do and Todoist tells me back what I have to do. And so that, that works quite well for me. For the company Hard Insights, um, you can always go to the company website and see a lot there. Their annual reports are full of good information. For some companies, the investor calls are interesting. Not always. Sometimes the questions there um, are not the most interesting, but but um, they, they can be interesting. There's a lot of investment banks that do equity research. I think Morgan Stanley is, is really, really good. So that, that uh, if, 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 if you can access that, that can be useful. Then if we look at more of the soft insights, if you look on the, the news and social media, you'll get lots of, of uh, insights on companies. The CEOs often have uh, interviews out on YouTube. So if you think that um, um, the strategy doesn't seem completely clear in the annual report, or you can you can sort of say that okay, but it seems clear in the head of the CEO uh, from the interview, or you can see that that the the, the CEO maybe not maybe he's not uh, exactly how you'd want him to be, and then and that that's a bad sign. If you look at customer reviews online and look at what questions people and users are asking, this can give you a, a good sense of of what are other people are thinking about their products. If you go out and look at the, the, the stores, if it's a retailer, you go and try to buy the product online, um, you, you, can, you can see if that's working well. Um, if you go on, on LinkedIn or Glassdoor, you can, you can see some things, what employees are saying and what type of employees are there. So do people have good CVs? Or does it seem like they're not getting the, the best employees? Also, if you are on the company website, you can sometimes see they have a big career section and it really looks like they're trying hard to hire people. That's for me is not a good sign. It seems like, okay, they're having trouble uh, maintaining the good people. They're having trouble hiring. There are other good companies where it's, they, they don't have anything like this because you know they're getting too many good people. Everybody wants to work at Apple or Tesla so they don't have this problem. But there are others where that's a, that's a, a weak sign for them. Um, sometimes if you look at competitor annual reports and competitor websites, it'll help you fill in the full picture of the company you actually want to know about because maybe the company you are analyzing, they will say like, we have the best product according to new users. But then you read in the competitors report, say, we have the best record, uh, the best product according to most users. And then you can see that they are best for all of them except new users. Then you know, ah, okay, yeah, the other one's saying they are the best with, with new users, but they're actually not the best because we can see that, that the other one is, uh, is probably better. So sometimes you can find some information about a company in the competitor's report. The big consulting firms, McKinsey, BCG, Bain, and also others, they have great websites full of uh, full of reports about industries, um, new technologies, new business processes, and so forth that can be investment objects, and and can um, and sometimes uh, 
uh, then you have IMF and OECD and uh, the World Bank. A lot of that data is available on trading economics as well. If you look at industry and associations, and also uh, sometimes with the help of these consulting firms, you can get some good um, industry reports. It's not always you can trust them, but they will uh, inform you. So if you have, for instance, uh, the semiconductor industry, and you you can see that it's been growing by 5% per, per year for a long time, and you, you think about it and you think, okay, it seems it'll probably continue to grow at 5%, but then you get an industry report that says it should grow at 8%. Then, you know, you read all the arguments in the industry report and you find, okay, there's no good arguments for why it should be 8% instead of 5 then that sort of tells you that you can be comfortable with your 5% estimate because if there were any good arguments for why it should be higher, they would certainly have put the arguments into this report. So since they didn't have any good arguments, there probably aren't any good arguments. And then you can sort of stick with your, your 5%. Uh, JP Morgan, Asset Management, Credit Suisse make a lot of good reports that are available. And um, on, on yeah, and they can sometimes do some of the number analysis that you were going to do, but then they've already done it. So that can be really, really helpful and trading economics that I showed a lot from earlier. They don't have everything. Sometimes you have to find it elsewhere. And sometimes some other companies have, have made some, some great numbers that are interesting. But these have the, the sort of big regular stable ones that everybody looks towards. Um, I think the best book for valuation is the one from McKinsey called Valuation by Color Goodhart and Vessels. It's a big book, but it's, 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 it's useful in many different ways. To, to supplement that, there's a great book by uh, Plainball called Financial Statement Anal Analysis, which goes more into sort of the story behind the numbers. The book this time is different, is the one with the 800 years of um, financial history that's um, cited by many, many people. Oftentimes when you see uh, the CEOs of big investment banks or big banks talk, they say something and it's, it's, it's taken from this book. Um, and it, it, it's a very, very boring book. It's terribly written. The charts in it are really, really bad. Um, but there's a lot of good information in it. So I sort of, I wish someone would, would or maybe they would sort of rewrite this book in a, in a, in a better way. And it's the same thing with this book about investments and portfolio management. It's some great information to have, but it's a very bad book. It's badly written. It's not very friendly. But if you get through it, there's some good information in it. For business strategy, um, as part of when you're if you're consulting for businesses and helping them improve their processes and the strategies, then um, that also helps you, of course, pick the right companies, the ones that are doing these things right and that don't have insurmountable challenges. One of the best books is Good to Great by Collins, Playing to Win by A.G. Laffley and Roger Martin is a great strategy book. The Pyramid Principle is also called The Consultant's Bible, a great book. And Contemporary Strategy Analysis is a good overview of just, you know, what, what should be included in the strategy. In general, I think it's really good to, to know a bit of statistics. A lot of investment mistakes are made based on simply not, um, not, not understanding statistics, not understanding if there's a number, what, um, what sort of po population of numbers is this coming from. And one book that highlighted that was The Black Swan by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, which came with a lot of examples of where people were making mistakes based on using statistics wrong. It's a great book called Sapiens by Yuval Harari that sort of talks a lot about um, seeing the world's history in a, as social constructs, which is really interesting. It's a lot of good books about a artificial intelligence, like super intelligence, uh, Homo uh, Deus, Life 3.0. Um, if you read all of these books, by the time you read the last one, you'll be a little bit bored because you're just hearing the same things again. Um, but if you're just going to read one of them, I think the Life 3.0 is the best one. Um, there's another great book called Thinking Fast and Slow by the Nobel Prize winner Kahneman. This uh, sort of explains very well why you should think slow about investments. Even if you want to act fast, you should sort of slowly build a good framework that you can then use to act fast. Um, and that, that sort of goes into those two different ways of thinking. One is the gut feeling and the, the quick instinct and the, the, you know, you see a picture, you analyze it instantly versus the, the really... Uh, turning the brain on and thinking hard about something and, and, and getting into to making a good analysis frameworks. I love the genre of biographies. I think it's a, it's a great way to, to get information about industries and, and companies by, by, um, by hearing the stories, life stories of some of the people that have been in leadership positions of these industries, like Jeff Bezos, Alan Greenspan, Warren Buffett, uh, Steve Jobs, Jamie Dimon, and so forth. Um, 
and uh, yeah, if, if um, not not all CEOs are blessed with having a good biography, some of them are not so great. That's that's unfortunate, but they can really be a good insight into into what has shaped the CEO. And along the way, you pick up a lot of different insights about the industry as well. Um, so that 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 um, was the presentation, and um, uh, we've had some questions along the way. But if you have more questions, uh, please uh, ask them now. If uh, if you find some questions later, you can always add me on LinkedIn. I answer the questions that I get from people on eToro and also the questions I get on LinkedIn. And um, if you want to uh, join eToro and copy me, please um, use this link here. You can also find it on my website, bondinvest.com, and that'll take you through to eToro and give me a little bit of a commission if you use my link. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, everybody, for participating. And I'm, uh, yeah, I'm ready for your questions. Thanks, uh, Jeppe. I uh, I think if you have any questions out there, write them, uh, and then uh, when they come in, then uh, then I can just pass them on to Yebe. In the in the meantime, uh, I would just like to uh, just uh, comment a little bit on on the, this presentation. It sounds like you're extremely thorough, Yebe. Um, how much time do you spend on this on a daily basis? Um, I mean, this is this is this is what I do. So this is my job, and part of it I consider fun. Part of it is, is complete work. If I'm, for instance, listening to an audio book about something, and that gives me an idea for more research, um, that's not as hard work as when I'm grinding in Excel. But probably I spend about half the day grinding in Excel and half the day um, sort of on more reading, researching, talking with people, chatting with people. I might might ha have a conversation with someone um, who I want to to teach me more about a, a particular model in a central bank or something. Uh, and then then I, I want um, then, then 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 that'll take some time. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so basically, so that, since, since you you're a, I think it's safe to say you're a long term investor. So so you spend your day information gathering basically and and data crunching. Yes, it's a lot of lot of, um, of of reading and analyzing and very little actual trading action. Um, so so and I, I mean I will read about many many companies and then I'll read about all of them and then I'll not invest. Then I'll read about a lot of other companies, I'll analyze them all and then I will not invest. Then I'll look at the companies I have, I'll look at them and then I won't sell. So there's a lot of lot of uh, lot of analysis and a lot of reading made for uh, before before every action. But then. Um, I mean that that that's fine. I don't need to be be doing something in the markets every day. If if I have a good investment and and I've done my thorough research on it and I keep following it, then then I I can feel quite a quite confident that I that I I still have the right things and I can also feel confident that I'm not missing too many things out there that I feel like I've I've dedicated the right amount of time for 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 exploring and and if if, if I get some ideas from people I talk to or from from what I read, or that I, I sort of feel like I've, I've dedicated some time to 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 analyze well, there could be more opportunities there, so forth. But yeah, you have to sort of manage that whole time with how much you're spending on just analyzing one particular stock versus the whole industry versus scouting for completely new ideas. Um, so so yeah, that that's sort of a, a time management exercise. Okay, uh, because obviously also a lot of our uh, uh, a lot of the people are invested there. They're not doing this full time. They, they of course, have a full time job on the side, and and they're trying to kind of get a feel for it uh, with the the time they have, which might be a couple of hours in the evening, a little and a little bit in the weekends. So, so basically, how with all this information that you're kind of data crunching and and searching for, do you have a comment on how uh, kind of with limited time you could get into uh, investing and trying to find the right companies? I think people can, in general, there's a lot of talk about the, the you want to be a big T, which means know a little bit about everything and a lot about one thing in, in particular. And I think so if, if, you, if you don't have to do a big discounted cash flow analysis of everything every time, but if you do it, you know, if you just try the exercise once with a company that you, you, you know well in an industry, maybe it's the industry where you work for, so you, you have, a, have a lot more insights there, that can sort of help you with that. But then having done that for that industry makes it easier for you to sort of look at the, the big level things for others. And something like looking at financial statements for a company, you don't have to look at, at everything all the way down. It's, it's enough that you know sort of just the, 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 the few big big multiples. And, and then from that, you can, you can make a, 
make at least a decision for how to make a, a, portfo- a, a portfolio. In general, if you make a portfolio and you ensure that you are diversified across different ge- geographies and across different industries, then I think then you're already doing better than, than many, many people. Some people think they're well diversified because they buy one index fund. That means they have only big American stocks or only big Danish stocks. That You have a lot of stocks now. You might have a thousand different stocks, but you are not well diversified because they're all from the same country and you know, and they're all of a, of a, of a similar type. So if you just just sort of focus on having different uh, different industries and different geographies represented in your portfolio, then I think you're already uh, quite far. And then if you can make the good scoops because you have um, have your your general reward in the markets for having. Um, some extra information so if someone has the algorithm that can look at the new financial statement the fastest there can be some money made there now after that's happened in a millisecond there is some time for who can make a quick human analysis and then there's money after that as well for who can sit down really long and think ahead for the long future so in all these things if, if so if you can have some some extra insights in a certain industry and can compare that to understand whether or not it's already in the price if you understand that a, a company is the big future but the price is also very high, then you haven't spotted anything and you haven't added any new information to the market, really. You're only adding information and getting rewarded for that. If you understand that something is really, really good and has a big future, and you can see that this is not priced into it at all, that this is not appreciated by the market. Okay. Um, I think um, we have a... A question that goes uh, back to the uh, the Tesla analysis you did, where you basically yeah. look 20 years into the future, uh, which I mean we have a comment from Knud Eric, Eric uh, that is a very long time. But do, do you do you see yourself holding stocks for 20 years, or, or do you end up diversifying? Maybe it's a an abstract uh, question to answer, but I mean, do you I do you see yourself you're... holding it for 20 years? Uh, def- definitely. Um, when I buy a new stock, I, I hope to hold it forever or at least 20 years. I'm, I'm hoping to buy a company and it'll just pay me big dividends year after year after year for a long, long time. If the price goes down to next to nothing or very, very high, technically I could, could, I could actually completely ignore that. If I believe strongly enough this company would continue to be very profitable with dividends, I just wouldn't sell the company. If the price came up a lot, then I would probably sell it. But if not, I would be happy to just have it and receive all these big dividends. Now, what can happen is that you buy a company and you think it has a great future and the price doesn't reflect it. And then, then you invest. But then after a time, it becomes common knowledge. Everybody can see that this is the future. And then the price goes up a lot. And at that point, I'll be like, right, now it's a great company, but it's also at a high price. So I'm going to gonna sell my stocks, which was, for instance, what I think happened with, the, with Netflix and why I sold that. That it was, it was very, very good. I was using Netflix. I was very happy with it. And then the stock price went up a lot, and I thought, well, now it seems that the price also reflects that great future, so I don't want to have it anymore. But if it had not gone up like that, I would just have you know, continued happily to have that stock and said that I think this is a great investment for the long term, and even if it's a bumpy ride there, I'll be very happy to be along for that journey. Okay. So, so I mean, this is basically you taking profits. Is, is there something that can shake you out of a stock? Because, I mean, it sounds like you're... you're you're keen to hold uh, hold the stocks that you believe in, but but what does it take for you to, to kind of get out of a stock that is not performing? Yes, I mean, if there's a company, for instance, that I, I've had before where I invested in a company and I knew they had some problems and I thought those problems would get fixed, and then I see, you know, a few years later, they still haven't gotten around to fix it. Now, that's just one example that just comes to mind. Then, then, then I'll, I, I, I sold out on that one on, on that ground. And there can be others where I think that there is a... There, there, there is a great potential, but for whatever reason, it, it, it changes, and, and that potential isn't there anymore. Um, and then you'll say, like, okay, I, what I saw spotted wasn't there, and um, then I'm not holding out for something else. And then I, I was still at that point and accept that uh, that it, it could be something like a move from a competitor, or it could be that that they, they have a product, and, and I think it's going to be really popular, but for whatever reason, it doesn't take off, and people are not as excited about it. And after a while, I just have to accept that, okay, this actually... This is not the, the 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 big future that I was anticipating, and and um, I'd rather get out now. And at that stage, it might even have declined a bit in price, and so you just have to sort of swallow that that loss and and, and put that money to better use elsewhere. Okay, we have a a question from uh, Morton, and uh, that is, which company have you invested in recently, and uh, why? 
I invested in a company called the Kronos Group, which is a cannabis company from Canada. And um, that was essentially because I, before that, knew that Canada was going to legalize uh, cannabis. And then I looked at all the different companies and I thought that there was a general problem that a lot of the, the cannabis companies, they come from a pharmaceutical cannabis background. So they're really, they are, they are really um, sort of pharma companies with a lot of uh, things like the doctor says and uh, and um, our research shows and they're sort of selling it like it's it's painkillers and and aspirin and i thought the the formula for, for cannabis here is going to be craft beer it, it has to be sold as craft beer and, and, and more like in the in the style of of, of, of uh, the big beverage companies and um, and then i thought that they were the ones that had sort of that was more in line with that and was selling it more as, as craft beer rather than as um as 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 a, as a, as a pharmaceutical uh, uh, medical cannabis, and so that that's why I picked that one. And in general, when you see there's a lot of there can be a lot of industries that grow, but the whole industry the industry as a whole is not going to make you that much money. Um, and so it can be important then to uh, in, in in markets in general they say that uh, it's five percent of the company that they deliver ninety percent of the profits, and and so so you wanna. I at least want to be bold and, and pick the one that I think is, is going to do better than the others. And then I, then I pick that one based on, a, on a, of course, all the, all, all the metrics that I've shown here before and, and thorough analysis and looking at the different, they're, they're, they're sort of like multiple companies in one company. And with some cannabis companies as well, you're essentially buying a farm. You know, it's, it's a farm with a tractor and it's, it's cost a billion dollars. So you sort of want to, uh, want to avoid that as well. Um, and then that that's uh, yeah I think that was that was the thing with the with the pharmaceutical background versus the selling it as craft beer that was the the, the absolute key insight for the investing in Kronos. Okay. Um, I think that's that's uh, we've been through uh, the majority of uh, the questions and also your presentation, uh, Jebe. I would like to uh, say many thanks to you for taking your time to share your knowledge uh, tonight. Um, I think it's been very, very informative and interesting, especially to see how how thorough you are and how much you dig deep into uh, the fundamentals of uh, of uh, both companies and the macroeconomics. Um, so, I hope uh, I hope all of you have found it uh, very interesting to to get this insight. Um, and I would like to thank everyone for joining the webinar. Um, I wish you a uh, pleasant evening. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.